Halo R brings us something I don't understand. Somebody writes, I was thinking about the idea of a fat village like Toronto's Gay Village, a neighborhood where dieting advertisements are banned, where all cafes, gyms, and shops are fat friendly, where all doctors, nurses, trainers are fat, a neighborhood full of street arts made by fat artists. Smile. Andre Leo, when your country is too inclusive to segregate you, so you segregate yourself. If this idea came from a non-fat person, those people would lose their minds and cry eugenics and discrimination over it. And rightfully so. Akal Lennon brings us, Thin privilege is not having to eat at home before you meet up with your friends for dinner, so you only manage to eat a tiny portion at your favorite restaurant, because no matter how much you like them, there's still the fear of being called out on eating the same food as them, because you're fat and they're not. Call me suspicious, but I suspect the real thing is, they're trying to hide how much they actually eat, so that they can claim they're just naturally fat because they barely eat. Grouchy Reflection brings us something I think I'm going to use throughout the whole video. It's the techniques of science denial. I won't go into it in detail here, but every time someone uses one of them, I'll mention it. And by the end of the video, we'll see how many of these things have been checked off. Naked Lobster brings us. The New York Times or something writes, Ozempic, a diabetes miracle drug that has become an off-label appetite suppressant, is changing the definition of being thin and what it takes to get there. Somebody replies, what if I told you that chemically inducing an eating disorder is not physically or psychologically healthy by any definition of the word? This is a false analogy. They're comparing two things that are not the same. Eating disorders are psychological, not physical. Post-revolution brings us another thing about Ozempic. People who are on Ozempic keep saying, I never think about or want food anymore. Is this what it's like to have a normal relationship with food? No, it's normal to want food. It's normal to enjoy food. You would die without food. I'm categorizing this as a misrepresentation and a straw man. That's clearly not what people meant. Noctarkana Circus replies, There's a word missing here, and it's constantly. When I started Metformin for my PCOS, I suddenly didn't think about want food all the time, regardless of how much I'd eaten before. That's the difference. Not wanting food at all isn't healthy, but neither is having it occupy your every waking thought. Fenzo brings us a little meme. It's a Spongebob meme. On a piece of paper it says, Fat bodies were considered attractive in the 1700s because it was a sign of wealth, not because it was healthy. Spongebob stares at the piece of paper, and he throws it in the fire. And in case you can't figure it out, Spongebob represented fat activists. Alive East brings us... Thin privilege is not having to learn both sewing and pattern making to have clothing that's fun, stylish, creative, fits well, or just fits, period. I'm classifying this as nefarious intent, where they think the whole world's out to get them. Beast with Teeth replies, As someone who is six feet and built like a spaghetti noodle, I'd like to introduce this person to my closet full of pants that have either the hems let out or the waist brought in, or both. Hmm. Fiorucci Angels brings us, Diets don't work, writes, This is my son's homework for the strike day. What's a strike day? Am I overreacting and saying I'm disgusted at this kind of thinking? Okay, here's the assignment. In the category of eating fruits and vegetables, there's a picture of a young boy. Above the boy is written the words, Can you write around the picture what it means to make healthy choices? So, in case you don't remember, Diets don't work was complaining that somehow this was insulting. I'm going to give this the category of persecuted victim. They seem to think the whole world's out to get them. Good Grab points out, it doesn't even mention weight. It just says eating fruits and vegetables as an example. Then it asks to write around the picture about making healthy choices. This could be anything, from studying for a test to reduce test anxiety, or playing outside to get more exercise. The original OP is just looking to get offended over nothing. Titanius Anglesmith adds, the kid could even list all the wonderful things fat activists want people to do if they could never lose weight, like get a full night's rest, move joyfully, do self-care routines, all that good stuff. The original OP is told on themselves in a big way. That much shame must be rattling around like a maraca with their last few brain cells. Oops, that was an ad hominem. Post-revolutionism brings us... I feel bad for people restricting food so they can be thin. Sorry you're so fatphobic it feels better to benefit from skinny privilege off the back of others being insecure than to eat that cookie, but more for me, I guess. Clap. 
This is a false choice. You can simultaneously enjoy cookies and not be fat. Jinx brings us. I'm debating if I should keep getting nutritional advice from my morbidly obese dietitian. She seems experienced in the field with a degree, but I can't get this thought out of my head. She has a BMI of 47. Am I fat phobic? I'm going to put this down as fake experts. I'm sorry, but a nutritionist with a BMI of 47 in no way can be an expert on healthy diet. They may understand the theory, but they don't understand the practice. H. Blowfish brings us. Today is hashtag World Obesity Day, and if you're a clinician working in the ED field while also treating obesity, congratulations, you're part of the darn problem. Today I thought I'd be extra visible because I'm the fattest I've ever been, and also the most free from my ED I've ever been. I'm categorizing this one as single cause. They think that the only reason for somebody wouldn't be obese is because they have an eating disorder. Which, of course, is absurd. Judge my face, people, brings us. History of diet culture and religion. Event. Catholicism became the reigning religion. Diet culture impact. Fasting and avoiding certain foods were common on religious holidays and as a form of penance. Event. Western Rome fell to the Ottoman Empire, which practiced Islam. Diet culture impact. The Roman Catholic Church educated its masses about Islam, stating Muhammad was indulgent of his senses, lustful, and ultimately the Antichrist. Event. Protestant Reformation. Protestant is an umbrella term for Baptist, Calvinist, Methodist, Pentecostals, Presbyterians, Lutherans, Congressionalists, and Adventists. Diet culture impact. Food became synonymous with morality. Finding pleasure in food corrupted the soul and dimmed intellect. Eating disorder behaviors were praised. Wealthy white men were developing and spreading these ideas because they could afford printing costs. Those who couldn't or wouldn't engage in these ideals were deemed inferior. I'm going to put that down as cherry picking, although I'm sure you could find a lot of other categories it would fit into. They found a few things that agreed with their theory, chose only those, and went with it. Judge my face, people replies. Ramadan? Hindu and Buddhist aesthetics? Fasting in Mayan medicine? Aboriginal tribal fasting practices? Never heard of those. Golden Grace brings us. It's a meme of a guy putting on a clown costume. Eating junk food when you want is mm, hurting yourself. I had the sense of that. And he gets more makeup when it says, no, you don't know better than your own body. More makeup. No, I'm not hurting myself. By restricting and exercising, I just enjoy being healthy. And if costume's complete and it says, ah, I love it when my muscles burn from exercise. Typically, I wouldn't call someone who hurts themselves a clown. But when you not only force said hurting onto others, but it comes at the expense of the entire fat community. I think there's a word that fits. Honk, honk, bee. This is a false analogy. They're comparing things that are not the same. And it's an ad hominem, since they're attacking anyone who disagrees with them. Separate grocery brings us an invitation to pause and reflect. Do you take note of all the ways fatness shows up in nature? People will try to convince you that fat isn't natural, but don't let them fool you. Fatness is all around us, never out of place in nature. The rolling hills, trees too wide to hug, animals we admire simply for their impressive size, elephants, whales, bears. When we look to this planet of ours, we can see fatness reflected back to us. The importance of diversity in all things. Our earth is nothing if not one big celebration of difference. How can we ground ourselves in the abundance of the natural environment? How can we observe it to learn lessons we can apply to ourselves and to others? This is another example of a false analogy, as Duzex Mathematica points out. Ah, yes, those fat hills and fat trees and other things that clearly must be fat because they are big. Yes, fat is everywhere when you redefine what is fat. I have learned that it's okay to be fat because things that are bigger than me exist, so there must be no limit to how big I can be. That's logic. Hopeful trouble brings us a rather selfish rant. Fudge you, Delta Airlines. I accidentally booked my flight to my provider retreat on the wrong day. So they admit right off the bat that everything that follows is their fault. Anyway, so I wanted to change it to the day before. To fly out at the same time would have cost me an extra $300, plus I'd need to get a room for a day earlier. So overall, talking about a minimum $500 plus. So wait, 
She's blaming Delta Airlines because if she arrives a day earlier, she has to get a hotel room. So at this point, I have no respect for this person because they're just whining. Anyway, they continue. This is capitalism and fat tax at its best. No, it's not. I went up the chain pleading Delta to help me out, but they refused. It was a non-refundable ticket. So, even worse, they bought a non-refundable ticket and then wanted to be refunded for it. Because of their own error. Ugh. It's times like this that I'm frustrated about the anti-fat bias that is permitted in this world. The representative Loveth said, I'm sorry, ma'am. If this is the option that best accommodated your body size, there is nothing else I can do for you. In a prior time, I would have beat myself up. I would have blamed me. But now, when it happens, and it happens more than I'd like, I try and remember who the real enemy is. Apparently herself. 1. Tag Delta and demand they do better for travelers of size. 2. Invest in my courses and support me financially. Ah, uh, so with this whining is just an excuse to get more money, I see. 3. Share this post to remind others that inaccessibility is not a personal problem, but a discrimination one. There was no inaccessibility problem, this was somebody signing up for the wrong day. Amend mended caption. Please hold your apologies. Your apologies don't change the fatphobic world we live in, or the suck I'm sitting in. Please hold your personal examples of fatphobia. In this moment, I don't have space to hold it for you. You know, if I had liked them up to this point, that sentence would have made it so I didn't like them. If you think everyone has to listen to you whine, but you're too good to listen to other people whine, you might be a bee. In lieu of those things, you can always just post a purple heart in solidarity. If you do not understand and are going to spend time in the comments questioning my experience, don't bother. Trust my word as a fat person and do not invalidate my experience by questioning it. I trust your word. That's why I think you might be a bee. And even though I'm sitting in the suck now, this poopy moment will pass. I will survive this. This wasn't on the science denial list. This is one I had to invent myself. It's called Everything is About Me. I think its name speaks for itself. Alterado brings us something that starts with a bit of news and then it goes a little off kilter. One of the compounds frequently used in reduced sugar, sugar replacements, increases blood clotting by a lot, up to doubling the risk of strokes and heart attacks. It looks like it would be a good idea to avoid it. I believe it's one of the sugar alcohols. Somebody replies, wow. Someone else. I have long wondered if many of the health risks associated with being overweight were actually risks of the things people do to try and lose weight. Saw an article on it once, but wasn't able to put my hands on it again. I think it'd be a fascinating study to dig into. I'm calling this one slippery slope. They think that because one minor thing was bad with this certain diet practice, that all the other ones must be bad, and therefore it's all bad. Someone else, I've been wondering that since the 80s when all these foods with fat substitutes came out, followed by sugar, fiber, etc. All these additive substitutes just eat food a normal amount. I guess that's good advice, but I'm not sure what they mean by the fiber. Fiber wasn't a new thing that came out in the 80s. It's been around for longer than people. The first person's back. Yeah, I'm not even talking about portion size. I'm saying that weight is a terrible indicator of health. Skinny people have heart problems, diabetes, etc. all the time. So do fat people. I'm curious if there's a ton of difference between skinny people and fat people who don't diet. This is, in my opinion, an example of anchoring. This is where you depend too much on one tiny piece of information and color everything based on that. The tiny piece of information they're blowing out of proportion is that all groups of people get heart problems and diabetes but they're ignoring everything else about it, like that fat people are more likely to get those things. Someone else. The paper I read and can't find again suggested that heart and other medical problems in fat people are caused by the extreme measures they often take in trying to lose weight, not because they are fat. I'm going to call this cherry picking. They're looking at only one study that they can't even find and going, this is the only study that matters. The first person. No doubt about this. I was bulimic, binged, and purged. It made my weight fluctuate so much that it broke my metabolism. Anecdote. This is a perfect example of an anecdote. And also, I think, an unreliable narrator. But unreliable narrator wasn't on the list. Firemaster replies to all that. I mean, food substitutes have been known to be bad for you. Like those Lay's Wow brand potato chips a while back? 
made of a type of oil that supposedly didn't get absorbed in the stomach, but because of that had to be taken off the market for causing like leakage in your butt, or people just stopped buying them because it became known that they caused said leakage. I remember eating those a long time ago, and a big issue with them was gas. I believe because the fat went through you without any issues, the bacteria in your gut was able to eat them like crazy and produce a ton of gas. Throw away played him, brings us. You can be lonely all day, or you can spend six ducks and get a Trenta pink drink from Starbucks and have a tasty friend all day. Clap. Someone replies, is it weird that I'll drink something like that in less than 15 minutes? I can't nurse a drink to save my life. Bob the Orange Cat replies, or you could, I don't know, interact with other living, breathing human beings? Would I? Such as a barista. Fell Diver brings us. Fat phobia is a public health issue. Fatness is not. I'm going to put this down as persecuted victim because they think that the fat people are being persecuted and the society is out to get them. Good grab. Half the time I wonder if FAs are being paid to spread this crap by the junk food industry. I'm beginning to suspect the same thing. Especially after seeing some of Keanu Doherty's recent videos, where it turns out McDonald's is sponsoring several things you wouldn't have guessed they were sponsoring. Alive East brings us. Journaling prompt number 32. If you knew that dieting and intentional attempts to lose weight wouldn't work for you, as they don't for almost anyone. What kind of healthy behaviors might you pursue instead? How? When? Angry Twig. I want to know what healthy behaviors people responded with. Black Mobius. Cake. Joyful exercise. Smiling. Denial. Seahorse War brings us. Your body dysmorphia or any other ED body image disorder is not an excuse for your fat phobia. You have to work through that just like everyone else. Many people both thin and fat, could afford to work through that fat phobia anyway. A lot of what you're feeling may just be fat phobia masked as something else. That's not always an easy revelation, but it's true. I'm going with single cause again on this. They think that all eating disorders must be caused by fat phobia, when actually it's a much more complicated issue. Alterado brings us, thin people don't need a special label for their self-acceptance practice because that isn't a political act. When you exist in a normative body, people in normative bodies need to make the decision to be explicitly pro-fat until that happens. We will continue the cycle of watering down fat politics until they can be co-opted by oppressive systems that exist solely to shrink us. That's definitely an example of slippery slope, where I think each small change is going to cause a massive disaster. I also have to add, it's a little bit rich based on the sheer amount they co-opt other movements, as we shall soon see. Ms. Beaver brings us, when fat people tell you what they eat and how they move, believe them. That's clearly an example of co-opting other movements. It's almost word for word what they say in the Me Too movement. Fat people are considered untrustworthy. People and medical professionals often question if we're telling the truth about our eating and exercise habits because they assume our body is telling on us. But our fatness is often due to many, many, many other factors outside of diet and exercise. You cannot tell what someone eats or how they move by their body size. Still don't believe me? We all know thin people who move very little and eat plenty of food who are still thin. I'm going with another example of unreliable narrator. Caught by the fun police replies, every episode of Secret Eater starts with, I don't eat enough to be this size. And then the episode ends with, you've been eating enough calories for two people. Surprise Pikachu face. Lakeside Miners brings us. It's in reply to another article about Ozempic. Fun media literacy exercise. In any headline about this topic, replace the term obesity with the phrase the existence of fat people and see how it sounds. I'm going to put this down as co-opting other movements again. They're trying to make it sound like various racial problems where people are trying to kill each other are in any way related to people losing weight. Xion replies, Fun media literacy exercise. In any headline about herbicides, replace weeds with adorable puppies and see how it sounds. Dazzling bug. It's so weird to me that they take it like this. Imagine this drug could end cancer. You mean you want to kill people with cancer? No, obviously that's not what we're saying, you dingpat. That's an ad hominem. Affectionate pie. 
We can end poverty. OMG, you're going to kill all the poor people? Ms. Beaver brings us. This is somebody complaining about the NEDA, which is an organization for helping people with eating disorders. NEDA, change your eating disorder screening tool on your website. You are asking people to use the site to screen for an eating disorder and have a screening tool that is a fat phobic mess. Content warning. Next slide show images of the fat phobic screening tool. During this Eating Disorder Awareness Week, NEDA is encouraging people to go to their website and complete the screening tool on their site. Given the recent responses from NEDA, or lack thereof, to the American Pediatrics Guidelines, I was concerned about what screening tool NEDA might be using, so I decided to check it out. Not surprisingly, the screening tool on the site is fatphobic and will be triggering for many people. I have included screenshots of this post so that you have a few examples of what I'm talking about and hopefully do not go and complete the entire thing. I am all for people getting information about whether they have an eating disorder or not. I'm not for people getting information about a fatphobic and triggering screening tool. NEDA, take down the screening tool from your website. It's causing harm to people during Eating Disorder Awareness Week and any other time it's utilized. I'm going to put this down as everything is about me. NEDA is trying to help people with restrictive eating disorders, and all they're worried about is its effects on the fat activism movement. And it's an incredible overreaction. Let's look at the actual questions. How afraid are you of gaining three pounds? Do you ever feel fat? Do you consume small amounts of food, less than 1,200 calories a day, on a regular basis to influence your shape or weight? Without accurate height and weight information, screen feedback may be inaccurate. What's your current weight? What was your lowest weight in the past year, including today, in pounds? Those are all perfectly reasonable questions to ask somebody when you're worried that they might be restricting their food too much. Forgot my old name adds, the same NEDA that has a couple of blog posts from morbidly obese writers that are lying about having atypical anorexia? That seems like an ad hominem. Same NEDA that had Reagan as an ambassador? That NEDA? Hefty Dig brings us. Today is Disability Day of Mourning. I'm taking time today to remember kids with eating disorders murdered by the rhetorical and material violence of their families, and in particular fat kids with EDs, whose murder is hastened by anti-fat eugenics at every level of the medical-industrial complex. We will mourn them, and we will avenge them. I'm going to put this down as conspiracy theory, since I seem to think people are out to kill children. Celtic Guardian replies, People who throw around the word eugenics carelessly like this really trivialize how bad it was, similar to people who invoke the Holocaust so lightly. Eugenics was the forced sterilization and killing of people deemed unfit. Doctors informing their patients of the risk of being obese and asking them to voluntarily lose weight to avoid said risks is not eugenics. Seahorse War brings us. In order to prevent eating disorders, we must make it safe to be fat. I'm going to put this down as single cause. They think all eating disorders are caused by bullying. Meg Pie Hearted Girl replies, So they're just going to pretend that BED isn't the most common eating disorder? Kooky situation brings us. This was on BuzzFeed. Somebody replied to an article. This article just shows that Americans are spoiled AF. We don't all want AC because it's really bad for the environment, and it costs a lot of energy. We pay for public bathrooms, but they're clean and don't have a gap. If Americans would have to pay for refills of soda and extra bed, maybe obesity would be less of a problem. The person who wrote the article replies, Please don't fat shame in my comment section or anywhere else for that matter. Your ignorance is neither welcome nor impressive. I'm going to call that an ad hominem, since they've resorted to insulting the first person. Cyanite replies, yeah, and the first person wasn't even fat-shaming people. They were just pointing out that endless refills of food items is a cause of obesity, which is a very real problem in America. I think the writer of this article is just upset someone was critiquing their poopy blog. Ad hominem. Zaza brings us. Diet Culture Dropout 2018. And it's a picture of somebody standing on a bunch of scales with some baby carrots smashed between her boots and the scales. Now, before I say anything else about this, I want to comment that those are some nice-looking boots. It's a shame the way they're being used. I'm going to call this one wishful thinking. 
They think that if they get rid of scales and carrots, that all their problems will go away. Jewish Space Medbeds replies, The brave heroes who led the charge against scales and raw carrots by stuffing their faces with Starbucks and McDonald's. There is something I want to know. How can you post that and not die of cringe? A stroke in the area of the brain where self-awareness is located? Terminal narcissism? Ad hominem. Frusciante Fongo brings us, BMI is a fudging terrible measurement and should be banned. Back when I was 75 kilograms and had 11% body fat, my BMI showed me as overweight and needed to be sub-50 kilograms to be healthy, which is impossible for my height and muscle mass. I'm putting this one down as just bad at math. Because I don't think so. Purple Towel did the math for them. Huh. So this person would need to be 4 foot 9 or 4 foot 10 to be a healthy weight at 50 kilograms or lower. Throw away all pits. Also, if they're claiming they were 75 kilograms at either of those heights, they would have been obese, not simply overweight. Uvla Speedbag gives us a little introduction to this one, which explains what's going on. For context, the original OP, to whom this commenter is of replying, stated that she has PCOS and insulin resistance, and has found that by beginning to eat intuitively, she only gets hungry about twice a day, once at midday and once in the evening. She explicitly says she's prone to binging if she eats when she's not hungry. So here's the reply to the person saying they're eating only two meals a day and are not hungry in between. I don't have PCOS, so I can't speak to that part of your question, but I've learned some about intuitive eating. What concerns me about your post is that you're saying you're listening to your body's hunger and fullness cues, which is good, but you also need to be smart about it. Of course, there are all kinds of ways to eat, but if you're only eating one meal a day and a snack, that's not enough calories to nourish one's body. They can't know that without knowing the meals. Many dietitians I follow online will talk about how you can't always rely on your body to give you the signals you need, especially after years of dieting or struggling with an eating disorder. You have to continuously give your body nourishment so it knows it's safe and can trust that it will get what it needs. One of the common causes of binging is restriction, so the idea that if you eat more often and allow yourself to eat a variety of foods, hopefully binging symptoms would decrease. If your doctors and dietitians are advising to eat more often, it's probably a safer bet to try to follow that and see how it works out. Again, I don't know about PCOS, but this is just my two cents. I hope you find something that works for you. I'm going to call this contradictory. They're on board with intuitive eating, but want you to ignore your body's hunger signals. Necessary C brings us. Stop colluding with your client's desire to shrink their bodies, hearts, minds, emotions, spirits, dreams, and imaginations. Intentional weight loss has a 95-97% to failure rate and causes weight cycling, which can explain many negative health effects of fatness. Induced famine, dieting, creates metabolic dysregulation, and stresses the body. I'm going to call this one magnified minority. That's where you take like one study, for instance, one that says there's a 95% failure rate on diets, and pretend like that's the consensus in science. Anyway, they continue. Reasons I do not collude with anyone's desire to lose weight. Encourages eating disorders, body dysmorphia, and self-hate. Capitalism makes money off us, believing we are inadequate. 80% of body size is determined by genetics. Only 20% is diet and exercise. My body is an heirloom. I inherited. What? Are they suggesting they move their soul into their mom's body? It is a living form of ancestral technology and wisdom. I come from a long line of fat people. I'm supposed to be fat. Our bodies have a natural range of weights, like they do in set point theory, which is why we regain weight after induced famine, because our body loves us. It wants to keep us alive. Body diversity is a good thing. Bodies are supposed to come in all shapes and sizes. Even if we all ate and exercised the same, we would still look different. Obsession with weight loss is a form of social control. If we are too busy dieting, we are less busy abolishing the state. Conformity is the enemy of body autonomy. When we give up our ability to self-determine, we let someone else take the wheel. I'm going to call that gish galloping, which wasn't on the list, but at this point they're just saying a ton of stuff and hoping that you get exhausted before disproving all of it. They continue, the origins of U.S. fat phobia are based on the invention of the white, civilized, black, savage binary. When you buy into diets, you buy into anti-blackness. Thinness is a white supremacist beauty ideal. We must ask our clients what they believe they are trying to achieve with weight loss. If the answer is confidence, better relationships with fat phobic family, less body pain or joint pain, more dates, better clothes, there are alternatives. 
Try building confidence, boundaries with family, strengthening joints and treating pain, trying new dating techniques, and finding niche fashion brands and working with a local tailor. Fat people deserve to exist and to thrive. We deserve to take up space. We deserve to have a society shift to fit us, not the other way around. When we assimilate into white supremacy, we leave oppressive structures intact and unchallenged. Nobody gets free. When we stay fat, we free ourselves and others. That was just more gish galloping. Alter Ato brings us. Weight loss surgery reduces the risk of premature death, especially from obesity-related conditions as cancer, diabetes, and heart disease, according to a new 40-year study of nearly 22,000 people who had bariatric surgery in Utah. This measures death, not instances of cancer, heart disease, and diabetes. Then people get better health care and lived. That's what happened. Healthcare kills by telling fat people to lose weight rather than investigating symptoms. I'm calling this one immune to evidence. No matter what evidence you would present this person, they'd always have an excuse as to why it's not true and how fat people are just as healthy as normal weight people. Enchanted Gal brings us Myth. Parents are responsible for their child's weight. Only bad parents let their children get fat. I'm going to call this one slothful induction. Slothful induction is when you have all the evidence in front of you. That points to one specific conclusion, but you won't take that tiny step to reach the conclusion. They're probably going to bring up medical conditions that make pediatric weight control hard, when in reality, the vast majority of obese children got that way by following their parents' poor eating and physical activity patterns. I'm very sympathetic to issues like the high cost of healthy foods and the lack of safe playgrounds many families face, but it's not helping anyone for fat activists to pretend that parents have no influence over their kids' weight. They need to know it's a problem. They have the power to solve and to not give up. Peyote Ugly brings us. There's a giant billboard. On it, it says, Welcome to Obesity USA, where the portions are four times larger than the 1950s. And someone complains, Imagine paying real money to advertise your fat phobia. I went to their website. It actually seemed okay. I mean, I didn't do a thorough search of everything they're saying, but here's an image that they use for their icon, if you want to look, and a little blurb to describe what they're about. What is Obesity USA? Obesity USA is a public health advocacy campaign developed by Pennington Biomedical to address the nation's growing obesity epidemic head-on. The campaign takes a visionary approach to not only raise awareness, but shift public perception of obesity as a disease dispelling the many myths that have long persisted, and arming individuals and communities with evidence-based research and the resources necessary to lead healthy lives. At least on the face of it, it sounds like a good thing. Although I am surprised they have a billboard up. I wonder if they're selling something. Uvula Speedbag brings us. This one starts out saying, Considering it's almost resolution season, I'm obviously thinking about fat people and about solidarity about non-fat people with EDs, and fat people of all kinds. I want us to remember that the unhealthiest diet, regardless of its contents, is one that's forced on you. The worst amount of calories is the one strictly managed and mandated by paternalistic authorities. The worst body is the one you are commanded to have, forbidden to change. And the best of all these things are the diet, lifestyle, habits, and body that you choose. Autonomy equals freedom equals life. Hashtag bodily autonomy, hashtag fat liberation, hashtag fat phobia. I'm going to put this as false equivalency. Dieting and taking care of yourself is not anyone forcing you to do anything. So the thing that they're complaining about and worried about isn't happening at all, in my opinion. There's no strict authoritarian government controlling exactly what we eat. Odd science brings us a weird one. Someone writes, and that is exactly the kind of attitude that prevents us from understanding the problem. The key word here is homeostasis. Every known effective treatment for obesity works via homeostasis and not via eating less. I'm going to put this down as a red herring. Homeostasis is where your body doesn't change. So you can't lose weight via homeostasis. It's impossible. Theophile Escargot replies, I'm not really sure what this means. A bit of Googling turned up the paper on homeostatic theory of obesity, which flirts with fat acceptance ideas, but doesn't seem that unreasonable. It writes, In light of the above theoretical discussion, four practical strategies for obesity prevention are 1. Putting a stop to victim blaming, blah blah blah. 2. 
devalorizing the thin ideal by enforcing truth in advertising. Three, reducing the consumption of energy-dense, low-nutrient foods and drinks. And four, improving access to plant-based diets. He summarizes, the thing is, a lot of diet and weight loss strategies boil down to do a load of woo-woo stuff and eat fewer calories. And while they work, they generally only work as well as eating fewer calories does. Here's one from r slash entertainment about the other side of fat logic. From Halo R. Hugh Jackman is bulking up for Wolverine by eating over 8,000 calories a day, chicken burgers, salmon, and more. This is definitely an anecdote and unreliable narrator. He probably isn't eating that much. And also I suspect he's doing several things that most people have too much respect for their body to do. Naked Lobster brings us, One day, people that believe they have food addiction will have to face that most of them are just victims of disordered eating, and that when you restrict food items, you're conditioning your brain to binge on them every time the chance is presented. Lol. I'm putting this down as single cause. They think that all dieting is disordered eating. Alter Edo brings us, I want diabetes to be seen as the valid disability it actually is. You can literally lose limbs, feet, toes to this disease. Folks act like diet, exercise, and weight loss is a simple cure for diabetes. It's not. Society treats it as a choice and not the legitimate chronic illness it is. You can do everything you can to try to avoid diabetes and still get it. It's genetic and not a personal failure or a lack of willpower. The pancreas is going to do what it's going to do. I had gestational diabetes, and finding out the placenta has the biggest influence on it was a surprise. I'm going to put this down as immune to evidence, although there's probably other categories it fits into as well. Anytime they're presented with evidence that diet and exercise might help with diabetes, they simply say it's not true. Okra Garden replies, What I hate most about people claiming diabetes is something that randomly strikes unlucky people, is that it is an extremely preventable and treatable disease. As an aside, for many people, not everyone. In the past 30 years, medical science has gone from thinking it was a progressive disease that can't be stopped, to realizing that blood sugar control can delay complications, to finding out that returning to a healthy weight can send some people into remission, to discovering that even a little bit of weight loss and lower carb consumption can actually send large numbers of people into remission. Fat activists would rather watch someone die an early and uncomfortable death than tell them the truth, which is that their eating and exercise habits most likely gave them diabetes. Hefty Dig brings us. Okay, jelly fudging chocolate. I have to write a post about why the idea of intuitive eating rubs me the wrong way as a solution to eating disorders. Not saying that it can't be a helpful tool in getting people back in touch with their bodies and unlearning certain lessons of diet culture, but I think it still enforces the societal harm that is weight stigma and discrimination. Here's why. 1. Intuitive eating still moralizes food in a highly uncomfortable way. The whole basis of intuitive eating is centered on the idea that if you let yourself eat the bad food, eventually you start to crave the good food. This is a bit of a straw man. Intuitive eating, as far as I know, doesn't classify things into good or bad foods. Which, in my personal opinion, is probably a major problem with it, but whatever. I'm not talking about in terms of morality, just to be clear. I'm talking about in terms of nutritional content. They continue, there are no bad or good foods. They are all just food. The food you eat in your everyday life is not medicine, nor is it poison, no matter what food it is. Your body needs sugar. Your body needs carbs. Your body needs fats. It's just food. It's just a way to get nutrients into your body. There's no wrong way to eat. Two, intuitive eating still moralizes body size and implies that thinness is the correct goal. One aspect of intuitive eating is the sometimes unspoken implication that once you learn how to eat correctly, you might not lose weight, but maybe you will, which would be great. In practice, this is still praising weight loss, even if it's unintentional weight loss rather than intentional. It still gives the message that thinness is superior to fatness, and that thinness is a healthy ideal to strive for. Like, this essay says, celebrating weight loss even when it is the result of intuitive eating and having more compassion for your body is still a commitment to thinness, and still perpetuates fat phobia and diet culture. Intuitive eating puts too much emphasis on hunger and hunger cues. That's the idea that once you learn how to eat better, your hunger cues will fall into place and you'll only eat when you're actually hungry. But guess what? You need to eat even if you're not hungry. <sighs> Why am I not surprised a fat activist said that last sentence? 
There are so many people who no longer or might have never had complete functioning satiety signals. People who have spent so long doing dieting and restrictive eating or battling eating disorders, but also people who suffer from illness or chronic disabilities which might affect the regulation of hunger cues. Some people will never feel hungry, but they still need to eat. And these people who never feel hungry, you find that a lot of them enter intuitive eating? Because I am highly skeptical. I've heard far too many people say that they don't eat breakfast, lunch, etc. because they aren't hungry in the morning. As someone with a form of dysautonomia, who becomes completely non-functional if I don't eat frequently, this attitude gets under my skin. Food is not about desire, or not entirely. As I'll get into later in this post, or about what you want to do, food is crucial, full stop, no matter what. I guess they're a little bit ignorant because most people could go an entire day without eating, and it would have zero effect on them. I don't recommend doing it frequently, but skipping a single day is not a big deal, and some people do it for religious reasons anyway. I think the fat phobic myth that weight is tied to health and is something that can be controlled has created this idea of food as something optional, something that is purely driven by desire. Diet culture has made us believe that eating is simultaneously an evil force that can control you and take over your body while simultaneously praising behavior of restriction, and at its heart, restriction is about choice. Eating is not a choice. Eating is an entirely mandatory, necessary part of life, the same way that sleeping is. It's regulatory. It keeps you alive. The best thing you can do for your body is to eat regularly and consistently. Sometimes it's really fudging hard to eat when you don't have an appetite or when you're nauseous. I completely understand that, just like it's really fudging hard to sleep when you have insomnia. But you still have to do it. Eating is not optional. It's not something you do when you want to. It needs to happen regularly, every day. It's a very basic part of being a human being with a body, and no matter the state of that body, it needs to be fed. Who are they arguing with? Who is saying that people shouldn't eat anymore? This is a great example of tilting at windmills. You don't need to feel hungry to eat. Some people will never feel hungry, and they still need to eat. And it's also okay to eat without hunger, even if your basic needs of satiation and nutrition have been met. This leads me to my next point. 4. Intuitive eating puts too much emphasis on mindful eating by continuing to constantly monitor and overthink your eating behavior. It becomes a chore. It becomes a pattern of overattention and scrupulosity. It becomes something moralized, the same way that it is moralized in diet culture. That's an example of slippery slope. One minor thing leading to catastrophic disaster. By all means, we should all try to be more mindful and intentional in our lives, but eating is just a basic fact of life. We don't consider whether we are mindfully sleeping or mindfully taking a shower. Eating is just a part of your day, just something you need to do, and I don't think we have to focus every moment of our attention thinking about what food is wrong or right to be eating or how we're eating it. In fact, I think everyone deserves to be mindless sometimes. Everyone deserves to thrown out in front of the TV or get sucked into a video game, and that includes mindlessly eating. In addition to being something basic and mandatory about having a human body, eating is one of the great pleasures in life. Like SEX or sleep, and like those things, it's completely fine if you just want a snack, or for no other reason besides desire. In absence of hunger or satiety, eating can be something completely neutral or comforting. Eating can be a form of stimming for sensory-seeking people. It can be fun. It can be fun. It can be used as a way of connecting with other people. In fact, eating with other people is one of the things that induces oxytocin, known as the love hormone in our brains, along with SEX, childbirth, lactation, and singing with other people. I'm sorry, but singing with other people, to me, sounds like torture. Telling people to be mindful when eating has the same flavor as the way we treat drugs or alcohol in our society to drink responsibly, eat mindfully, as if food is actually something that could harm us, rather than simply being the nutrients that keep us alive. I'm going to give them also immune to evidence. Any evidence that some foods are bad for you, they ignore. I really don't think that teaching people to overthink their food choices or behaviors is going to help anyone. Instead, it needs to be clear that there are no morals attached to eating, nor the foods themselves. Eat when you need to, and also eat when you want to. Eat for fun, for connection with other people, for pleasure, for sensory stimulation. Eat without thinking about it. That's the only way you can normalize it. Oh my god, I can't believe it. They're still writing. You don't need to eat in the right way. There's no right way. You just need to eat. Also, this is meant for everybody, not just people who struggle with eating disorders or have been harmed by diet culture, but this is especially for fat people. Fat people are shamed constantly for extremely natural and necessary practice of eating, regardless of their actual eating habits. And I fully believe that unless we center fat people and their experience in the anti-diet conversation, we'll be trapped in the same horror of moralizing bodies, food, and basic human needs that we have been for centuries. 
you are allowed to eat, no matter what. Alistair, the torturer, replies, So food is not about desire, but it's also one of the great pleasures of life. I should eat when I don't feel like it, up to and including feeling nauseous. This is good for me? Logical plantain. I actually do practice mindfulness doing routine tasks such as taking a shower, brushing my teeth, and trimming my nails, as well as going to bed to sleep. Because of my mental illness, I have to do it mindfully. It's important for me to feel the water on my skin, to focus on the sensations. It is essential to feel the softness of the pillow and the weight of the blanket. Yes, some of us are mindful while taking a shower or preparing to sleep. It is completely healthy, and it actually benefits some people's mental health. I can't with these people. McKill. They clearly don't understand what the word mindful means. Thinking about the morality of food while eating is not mindful eating. Dorkita brings us. I've been on this anti-diet journey for so long now, it's been years. I feel confident in myself, and my decision to give up on the idea of trying to lose weight or maintain a body through restricting. But even though I know how harmful dieting is, even I sometimes hit a roadblock where I find myself questioning things. An older relative of mine posted this this morning, trigger warning, weight loss. My blood work has come back perfect yet again. The doctor won't use the word cured, but he told me there's no sign at all of diabetes anymore, and no sign of pre-diabetes. My cholesterol is within the good range. My weight is perfect. The doctor asked me the doctor asked me why I've improved so much, and I had to remind him that I lost XXX. Removed numbers in order to follow rules of group, Doc said. I remember, but some things just deserve repeating. You should be proud of yourself because I'm proud of you. I just want to ask the lovely and far more educated on these things than I am people of this group, why does weight loss help these things like diabetes? Within the anti-diet community, I've been told that weight loss doesn't cure anything and that weight in itself doesn't cause these types of health problems, but why do some people experience benefits from losing weight? I'm asking these things not from a see weight loss is good perspective, but from a genuine I would like to know the answer so I can better understand why this happens and why dieting is still not the answer. Thanks for approving this post. Added to add, my relative says the only thing she has done to lose weight is eat less and intermittent fasting. No exercise. I'm going to put this entire group down as immune to evidence. No matter what evidence they're presented, they won't change their beliefs. Someone replies, If your friend made changes like adding exercise, incorporating more fruits, veggies, whole grains, etc., those things could improve biomarkers while also causing the person to lose weight. But if they'd made those changes and not lost any weight, the biomarkers would still have probably improved. It's the changes to behavior that cause the improvements in BG, cholesterol, etc., and not the weight loss itself. Like, if your friend got COVID and was horribly sick for months and lost weight due to having no sense of taste, do you think the biomarkers would have improved? I kind of doubt it. I lack a clever pun, replies to that part. It's the changes in behavior that cause health to improve. They really do think weight loss is spontaneous and not due to changes in behavior. Gruntledex replies, in response to the copium-laden commenter, I lost 10 pounds due to COVID, and my blood pressure finally came down to normal from prehypertensive. So yeah, even unhealthy weight loss improves biomarkers. Man, that must have been some nasty COVID. Someone else replies, I'm going to make the first comment. I can almost guarantee that the weight will not stay off. The positive behaviors that this person undertook may be the reason for the improvement in blood sugar numbers. There is no, and I mean no, diseases that weight loss will cure. Maybe it was less stress. Maybe it was a variety of foods. Maybe it was more outside time. Maybe it was better sleep. Those are things that they can control. Body size is not one of them. Weight is not controllable. There will be a day when this person is tired of restricting and start eating the other things. It may not be today, or even a month, or maybe even a year, but it will happen. The body will rebel. Another person, so-called group expert. You said your relative is eating less and doing intermittent fasting. In other words, restricting and not listening to her body. On the surface, that's going to look like her diabetes is cured. However, it's a band-aid on a different kind of problem. A1C is a measurement that only looks at the amount of blood sugar that one has in their bloodstream over three months. That's it. However, that's the number doctors use to diagnose and manage type 2 diabetes. The actual underlying issue is insulin resistance. This happens when the cells don't recognize a hormone called insulin. Yeah, thanks for explaining something incredibly simple. It's insulin's job to carry blood sugar through the cell walls to feed the cells so they can do their work. When we have insulin resistance, there's a communication problem. The cell walls think it's not supposed to be there, so they don't let it in. Then two things happen. There's a buildup of blood sugar, 
and the cells are starving. The brain gets two messages to correct this. One message says to get more food to feed the cells. The other says, well, I guess we don't need this energy, so we'll store it for later, weight gain. It's a constant cycle of person feeling hungry, low energy, and having high blood sugar levels as well as gaining weight. In the doctor's mind, they automatically go into restriction advice. They think reducing or eliminating carbs will solve the problem, but it's not the carbs' fault here. It's improving the communication with insulin. Your relative can restrict all she likes, but that communication problem will still be there. It's just dormant now, so no, she's not cured. To be fair, the doctor didn't say she was cured. He said that all of her markers were fine. Obviously, if she went back to eating badly, the diabetes would come back. Duh. Now she has disordered eating on top of her insulin resistance. Now she's afraid of food and eating stuff in fear of a different A1C and not getting praise for being restrictive enough. Uh, no, she's in fear of getting diabetes. This person's really encouraging me to make an ad hominem here. The weight will most likely return and bring friends within two to five years. The weight was lost because she's in starvation mode. It didn't improve her health, but she's in the honeymoon phase of restriction right now. Nothing is going to talk her out of this. She's just got some strong validation of her restriction helped her when it's really all smoke and mirrors. And she's going to be on her high moral horse now and look for more validation so her restriction continues. Meanwhile, she's probably starving or completely dissociated from her cues, obsessed over food, and only feeling good about her body when people compliment her, which is why she publicly posts about this stuff. Just to add, there are a lot of ways to manage blood sugar without restricting or focusing on the scale. Part of this is genetics, and part of it is a change in what they consume. So almost everyone in my family has a thyroid disease, and me included. Thyroid disease is a horrible excuse because it's easily treated. Almost everyone also has diabetes. I don't, but I'm by far currently the one in the biggest body. Now they don't understand statistics. A bigger body puts you at higher risk of getting diabetes. It doesn't make it certain. I'm nowhere near having diabetes. I do consume a lot of food that would normally be thought of leading to diabetes. I think this is where genetics plays a part. For whatever reason, my body can regulate the glucose insulin better than most of my family can. Several family members have had bariatric surgery. Several restrict. I refuse to do either. I have a lot of GI issues and really busted my tush since 2019 to work on what I eat and what causes GI issues for myself. This was through an elimination diet and then intuitive eating. I started on my own, but the last leg required a nutritionist to help me free me from the last bit of bad thinking that was still lingering. Now my GI system is doing better than it has in 30 plus years. I'm absorbing nutrients. Not a single doctor has told me to lose weight in years. The health issues I have are more likely to cause weight gain, and the meds I'm on can cause that too. For the most part, I was able to keep that pretty stable. Then perimenopause set in and all that changed, but it is what it is. I still work daily to find what works for me in the moment. Would I like to be in a smaller body? Probably, but mostly so I can go on rides at theme parks and have an easier time finding cute clothes. It's not related to health, so I don't worry about it. If I lost all the weight I used to want to lose, I still would have the same health issues. And another person replies, weight loss doesn't solve diabetes, despite what doctors are brainwashed into believing. Emo Banana replies, doctors have been brainwashed. Are you sure it's not you? It's also important to remember that the gold standard for weight is the BMI, but there is no common symptoms, which is one of the core definitions of disease. It's just an arbitrary number. Correlating things with BMI doesn't make that data any more meaningful, especially when those same health concerns are independently caused by weight cycling. Since 95% of us can't statistically maintain the weight loss, best we can do is weight cycle. Is your relative part of the 5% that can sustainably maintain weight loss? Possibly. I know maybe a couple of folks who seem to be. They stayed on their diet for five plus years, but perhaps more importantly, as someone else pointed out, they became more active and added more fruits and vegetables to their meals. So is it that they shrunk their bodies or that they engage in behaviors better for their health? Or is this relative still in the weight cycling cycle and just hasn't hit the threshold where the body revolts and the weight comes back? Possibly. And the admin replies, please be cautious with your answers. This post will be moderated. The acceptance of weight loss as an answer will not be accepted. Any attempts to validate weight loss as the cure will be deleted. Talk about living in an echo chamber. Good grab. Sane person. I lost weight and for all intents and purposes, type 2 went away. Fat activist. That's impossible. Restricting certain foods can't cure diabetes. Sane person. My A1C number is in a healthy range. 5.5 
Fat activist, that only measures blood sugar levels for three months. Sane person, yeah, I'm done here. Hefty Dig brings us, in case some of your fudge butts are confused, fat phobia is on the same level as racism, homophobia, transphobia, ableism, sanism, and literally any other kind of oppression. Want to know why? Because being fat is genetic, and you can't change being fat any more than you can change your skin's color or orientation or disabilities or whatever. Fat is so reliant on genetics that the vast fudging majority of fat people are physically unable to get to a healthy weight. That's why the studies saying fat is genetic and weight loss is futile are becoming more and more common. Because people are waking up to the fact that personal responsibility when it comes to weight loss is a myth. It's a myth. You can pull sources out of your butt if you want to. Argue with me. Because I'm not sourcing my own fudging worth as a human being for your burden of proof. And in case you're going to get chocolatey with me about me comparing fat phobia to other oppression, I'm Blasian gay trans disabled, and so you can all sit the fudge back down and stop arguing things you so obviously know nothing about. I'm going to give this person persecuted victim. They think everyone's out to get them. Real life CSI guy replies, you know, I wasn't planning on listening to a word they had to say, but immediately being called a fudge butt and then being cussed out and called names in almost every sentence really won me over with sanity and rationality. Excessive swearing and insults really is the way to go for getting people to listen to you and take your side. Borak Gray brings us something I'm only repeating because of the numbers involved. Wah, fat people are demanding we find them attractive or we're bigoted. Honestly, yeah, you're all brainwashed. I'm willing to wager 95% of you would have attraction to fat people if you lived in a society where we weren't literally brainwashed into believing fat people are ugly. Unlearn it. Kangaroo. Lol. That 95% again. Maybe 95% of diets would work too if you unlearned your bad habits. You know, I read that 95% of all 95% statistics are only 5% accurate. It must be true because I said the number 95 Sufficient hat brings us. Someone tweets, Most foods are processed. That is, they've been through a process to transform the raw ingredients in some way. Cooking, for example, is a process. Processed foods are not bad any more than unprocessed foods are good. Let's at least have some accuracy in our language around food. Truffles the mushroom replies, I agree. We should have accuracy in our conversations about processed foods. The NOVA classification is a great place to start. Let's look at the NOVA classification. It makes four groups. Group 1, unprocessed or minimally processed foods like fruit, vegetables, eggs, meat, milk. Group 2, foods processed in the kitchen with the aim of extending their shelf life. In practice, these are ingredients to be used in the kitchen, such as fats, aromatic herbs, etc., to be kept in jars or the refrigerator to be able to use them later. Group 3, processed foods. These are foods obtained by combining foods of group 1 and 2 to obtain many domestic products, such as bread, jam, and they are made up of only a few ingredients. Then there is group 4, ultra-processed foods. They are the ones that use many ingredients, including food additives that improve palatability, processed raw materials, hydrogenated fats, modified starches, etc., and ingredients that are rarely used in home cooking, such as soy protein or mechanically separated meat. These foods are mainly of industrial origin and are characterized by a good pleasantness and the fact that they can be stored for a long time. I believe when most people say processed foods, they're actually referring to only group four. The other three categories most people consider as barely processed or unprocessed. Ms. Beaver brings us, There is no war on obesity because you are talking about people. There is intense and violent discrimination against fat people and the harm and ruin that causes to people, the war on obesity is a war against fat people. This is definitely a straw man. They're arguing against something that isn't real. They continue, Any call for eradicating fatness is a call to do violence on people because they don't like how they look, because fatness is relative. Some people will always be bigger than other people, and what counts as fat is always in flux. I'm going to count this also as an ad hominem because they're accusing other people of violence when they weren't violent. And also I'm cutting this one as anchoring, because they're relying upon the fact that BMI scales have changed over time, 
and they're giving way too much credence to the initial value for the BMIs and ignoring the fact that it changed to be more accurate. They continue, the war on obesity is merely a call for the continued existence of permanent underclass that is socially acceptable to harm and to celebrate the harm you inflict. And no, fat activism has not gone too far because the simple request that fat people be treated the same as thin people is still treated like it is an unhinged thing to expect. And, yes, a lot of fat people are mad about that. You think fat activism has gone too far because you found out that fat people don't enjoy being treated like garbage? Buddy, we're barely even getting started. Thin people never even think once about what it would be like to be fat in a culture that hates fat people so much. They never even consider what it would be like. They just enjoy their thin advantages that are purchased with the harm done to me. Yes, I am mad about that. Star of the Strange, what counts as fat is always in flux. Maybe for your social movement, LMAO. Scientifically, we know exactly what the classes are. Underweight, healthy weight, overweight, obese, obese 2, obese 3. Yes, it varies from person to person. Yes, it is not absolute. But no, it is not the massive question mark that will keep moving smaller and smaller. Prefer uh, something brings us. It's something from TikTok. I saw someone on here fear-mongering about how important counting every single thing that goes into your mouth is by saying that she was consuming over 500 calories of coffee creamer with her morning coffee, so I wanted to show you how much creamer you'd need to go over 500 calories. The coffee at this point basically looks like milk. I'm going to call this misrepresentation. Probably the person was drinking five cups of coffee and using a lot of creamer in each, and it added up to 500 calories or something like that. It's unlikely they used all that creamer in the one coffee, or they were using a mixture of creamer and sugar. Silver Fawn. I legit had a coworker who would do this. It was disgusting looking. She'd just smile and be like, I like a little coffee with my creamer. And also at the same job, I was talking once to another coworker as she was pouring sugar into her coffee. As we were talking, I got distracted as I watched her keep pouring more and more sugar, waiting for her to stop. She poured until the whole container was empty. She finished it. She'd also come in with a large Starbucks Frappuccino with whipped cream every single day. But claimed to cut soda to lose weight. Ishimura Huntress brings us. This is somebody complaining about a picture. There are like four fat people in these two pictures. Body positivity is about more than fatness, yes. But not only was it created by fat people, it wouldn't exist without us. But there are 18 people in these two pictures. Like we really couldn't even pull together the care to represent five people out of 18 as fat in pictures that have body diversity as their entire purpose when fat people account for billions on the Earth's population. But you know what? I guess this is body positivity since that movement has been smothered by thin people, making it all about feeling good and pictures of themselves bending over to show a forced stomach roll. Fat people are so underrepresented in body positivity in the movement we created that we had to make a second movement called Fat Liberation to be actually represented and to not have our oppression dismissed as just body shaming. We have been that excluded in body positivity. So in a way, these two pictures are perfect examples of body positivity. Spot on. I think I've said this before. Calling something body positivity and expecting it to only be about fat people is an example of bad branding. If you want something to be about fat people, there should be a hint in the name that it's about fat people. How is this not obvious? Also, the meaning of words change over time. You have to live with it because you can't fight against all of society. God, I'm fudging tired of fat phobic chocolate being passed off as body diversity to the point that the body positivity and body diversity tags aren't even viable for finding good fat representation to reblog. I have to avoid these two tags like the plague because 95% of these two tags is just thin people and literal something I have to black out. And then on top of that, any plus size tag is half full of thin people calling themselves plus size for clout and another 30% is fat people with internalized fat phobia. But I have no other choice than to look at plus size tags for fat representation because any tag that uses the word fat is just thin spo and fat something. I love this website. Yeah. I'm going to put this down as everything is about me. It's not on the chart, but this person clearly only cares about things that affect themselves. Pinecone Jones replies to this. There were probably lots of fat people in the photos that they didn't deem fat enough. I've gotten dogpiles for saying I'm fat. Apparently I'm thin. 
despite having a BMI of 37 and over 40 inch waist, have noticed the threshold for what they consider fat is always getting bigger and bigger. Ms. Beaver brings us something about the movie The Whale. If you've been a subscriber for a bit, you know I produced an entire guide to that awful fat phobic movie The Whale. I hadn't realized that Fraser's character died at the end of the movie and learning connected some things for me. So she wrote a guide to it without watching it. Nice. Second, that's why so many thin folks think this movie was deeply moving. What they considered trash took itself out. Fraser's fat character was a neatly self-solving problem, removing himself from the world and ceasing to trouble us with his existence. This is definitely a straw man. They've made up something that they think other people believe and are attacking it. Xion. Doctors, etc. want to eliminate fat people in the same manner as dentists want to eliminate people with cavities. The only difference is that the latter people don't make their entire identity out of their cavities. Carping all the DMs replies, That's very cavity phobic of you. Ms. Beaver brings us more. I contacted the British Board of Film Classification to ask if they're in a position to ban hateful, harmful movies that are available for viewing in the UK. The newest extremely fat hitting movie, The Whale, needs to be banned in every country. Are they seriously asking people to censor this relatively bland movie? What world am I living in? Everyone involved in making it and supporting it needs to be held accountable for the harm and real trauma they are causing. I encourage people in every country to find out how to get this movie and all fat-hating movies banned. The entertainment, film, and music industry needs to be better regulated as it is not creative but exploitive and elitist. Nepotism is rife within it. These industries serve to further hateful capitalist agendas, and it needs to end as soon as possible. I want to see authentic creativity and talent. I want to see fat, positive movies, or movies where fat people are not dehumanized, stereotyped, and stigmatized. I want to put an end to all movies that promote hatred toward fat people, all movies past, present, and planned. As I always say, there's nothing wrong with being fat, and everything wrong with a fat, hating world. They add, and no, I have not watched it. And I will not put myself through something I already know is hateful. Fat people experience so much hatred from others in our real lives, so why on earth would we choose to watch more of it? Same goes for gore and horror. Have people not seen enough suffering in real life already? I don't understand why people would want to actively traumatize themselves. It's a sickness to enjoy gore. It's not entertainment. I'm going to go with overriding suspicion on this. They definitely have been told the movie isn't about what they're claiming and they disregard any evidence that doesn't support their theory that it's a hateful movie. They continue, Fat-hating films should never have been made. They without a doubt create more violence and hatred toward fat people. Fat-hating filmmakers are obsessed with getting shock value out of fatness. Putting an actor or actress in a fat suit is stigmatizing and dehumanizing to fat people. It is hateful and unethical and shows zero originality and creativity. P.S. If you watch this movie or any other fat-hating movies and think it's acceptable, then kindly fudge off entirely for my life. Molly scribbles, I haven't seen it, but know that it's a bigoted movie that should be banned everywhere. For fudge's sake, most people I've come across who've made a point of hating a specific movie, book, etc. are people who are very familiar with that movie, book, etc. See the Twilight Ranchers who realize that reading the book means you can roast it for describing an island as being off the west coast of Brazil. And more about the whale. Cracked rib cages brings us so disappointing that the whale won the Oscar for best hair and makeup. Fat suits are harmful. They are not your opportunity to win awards. Our identity is not your costume. Cast fat actors to play fat characters. Just catching up on the Oscars after being away from my phone, and the whale won best hair and makeup? Yikes. I think I've written enough about the whale for y'all. I won't go into it too much more. But for it being an Oscar winning film over the fat suit is just such a fudging perfect bookend for this Butterfinger hateful film's legacy. All right, that was more than too much about that movie. This one comes to us from addiction. If you're confused about why animal people advocate for keeping your pets at a healthy weight, but sometimes also in the same breath will advocate against human diet culture, it's because we know what body condition a cat is supposed to be at optimally, but literally there's not one for humans as far as we can tell. I'm going to mark this person as immune to evidence. Despite the vast evidence that we know roughly how much a human should weigh, they disregard all of that evidence and say it's not true. 
They continue, humans are weird, opportunistic, hyper-adaptable, and variable primate, and we have evolved to have a lot of variety in size, shape, metabolism, and weight retention. I've seen a lot of different cat sizes, so I think they actually have more variety in size. This has been essential to survival in hard times and easy times. You know the thing people talk about sometimes? How about half the population are night people and about half are morning people, so we'd be better able to watch at night as a group? Yeah, weight variation is like that. There's a lot of latent variation in human populations because as communities, we survive significantly better if some of us are fudging ready to not die during the long-ass winter of death, and some of us can eat their weight in fish and then run a mile immediately after. Okay, that sentence is incredibly ignorant. Anybody who's run after eating a large meal would know that that's wrong in two ways. You'll get incredibly sick if you try to run after eating a lot, and trying to eat your own weight in food is impossible. This is why some people gain muscle crazy fast and some people don't. Muscle requires a lot of energy, so some people are built to gain a lot during a plentiful season and be really efficient, and some people are built to use less energy over time and be more useful during a long, hungry period. Just because you don't see all of the work that somebody does to put in to gain a lot of muscle doesn't mean that they gain muscle crazy fast. It's insulting to the people who put in a lot of work to gain muscle. They continue. Cats and almost all other vertebrates simply don't have the kind of complex community variation built in and tend to be much more uniform in build and weight. Humans tend to be really variable in body and brain, and that's one of the biggest factors that have made us so successful. There are just a lot of ways to be a human being. Of the science on the ideal human body condition we have at the moment is almost entirely BS and was done by white supremacists for eugenics purposes. It's just not something we know, and right now there's significantly more evidence that there is no ideal body type for everyone to reach. Recent research indicates that humans are healthiest at a variety of weights and builds, and dieting is almost universally bad for you, even if the culture hasn't caught up yet. Well, we're at the part of the video where we can look at that chart. And if you do, you can see that roughly 60 to 75% of the chart has been covered. I probably missed a couple, so there might have been a few more check marks that were needed. So at least in my opinion, this is definitely a conspiracy theory, since they use almost all of the conspiracy theory, arguments, and methodologies. This one comes to us from 20 A. Ah. It's a little bit of sanity. Some perspective since leaving the fat acceptance movement, and also losing 180 pounds and maintaining it. Fat activists argue that no one is more fatphobic than us former fats. Maybe it's because they have no idea how much better their life would be if they weren't fat. I thought I'd make a list of things that are better now that I'm fit, and maintaining my weight loss, and things that were better when I was fat. Being fit. I'm not out of breath, doing literally everything. My feet don't hurt anymore, and neither do my joints. I don't sweat constantly. My thighs don't chafe anymore, because they no longer rub together when I wear skirts or shorts. I can run, ski, and cycle. All things that were too hard when I was fat. It's easier to find a wide variety of affordable and cute clothes. I don't worry about breaking chairs anymore, or worrying if I can fit in a chair or amusement park, ride, or whatever. I can easily fit in an airplane seat now and don't need to buy two seats. I'm no longer type 2 diabetic, also my fatty liver disease is completely reversed. I now have appreciation for good nutrition, and while I definitely still enjoy McDonald's or a good cake sometimes, I don't feel the need to go to that first thing anymore. As a result, my stomach feels better. I can actually go outside and play with my kids or play with them at the park instead of sitting on the bench. Too much information warning, but I can easily wipe myself now. Trust me, when you weigh what I used to weigh, you cannot do that easily. Towels and robes fit me well now. I rode a horse recently for the first time in my life. My weight prohibited that before. I can buy fashionable shoes now, and not just orthotic ones. My skin cleared up. My hair is healthier. Much easier to find affordable bras now that my band size is 34 instead of 46. I can clip my own toenails now. For the longest time, I had to have my husband do it. I was out of breath, trying to reach over and do it myself. Embarrassing, but true. I can rely on exercise or hobbies to cope with life instead of food. My balance and flexibility are better. My digestion is better and the benefits of being fat. I thought really hard and couldn't come up with a single advantage I had when I was fat. I was unhealthy, unenergetic, 
miserable, and there was literally no benefit to it whatsoever. I had no idea how good life could be until I got into shape. They continue, so if there's literally no benefit to being fat, but one million benefits to being fit, why on earth wouldn't you choose the latter? Because there's no benefit to being fat and anyone that claims to be fat positive. They're just miserable people who gave up on the rest of their lives and want to live in denial. I'm including this one because I thought the replies were funny. And Life Pro Tips, Mad Skiz writes, Life Pro Tip, you don't have to work out to lose weight. If your goal is simply to lose weight, you have to focus on your nutrition. Mectonia replies, It takes me 30 seconds to eat more calories than can be burned by an hour of exercise. Original ad, Amateur, I can do it in 10 seconds. Checked out username Vlad. Give me 3 seconds. 1 hour running, 1,000 calories. 130 milliliters of olive oil, just over half a cup, 1,046 calories. That really sounds gross to drink, though. Ugh. In Relationship Advice, Thor R.A. writes, I removed my friend of 8 years because she didn't congratulate me for losing 100 pounds. I lost 100 pounds over lockdown and saw my best friend of 8 years, who was also obese with me whilst growing up, in high school after lockdown had been lifted. She didn't even acknowledge my weight loss. It was like an elephant in the room because our first conversation after seeing each other was very awkward, which was weird for us. We would never run out of things to talk about when I was bigger. After that, she stopped trying to see me because our class schedules were opposite, but we would always try to work around it before lockdown. But it's like when I lost 100 pounds she ghosted and only messaged me to vent about her family. She would vent without permission to. Hmm. I had to block her because I couldn't have people in my life that weren't happy for me. We both shared the goal of losing weight since we were 10. We even tried to lose weight together until like the age of 14. So I found it weird that she never acknowledged it because she had known that I wanted this for literally most of my life. I know if I was in her shoes, I would definitely feel jealous. It's normal to feel jealous. It's a human emotion, but I would also congratulate her and even use that as a motivation and ask for advice because distancing yourself and not commenting on it does make you seem like a hater. But I also realized throughout our whole friendship, she never complimented me, but I would compliment her. I removed her in June, 2022. And sometimes I feel like it was quite an almond joy thing to do and self-centered reason to remove her because maybe it's something she desired for a long time and didn't feel quite comfortable bringing it up. Sometimes I feel like I overreacted because I shouldn't really expect anyone to bring up the fact that I lost weight especially from someone that's still overweight. Unrelated, but another overweight friend of mine distanced herself too. And the thing is, I would never bring up my weight loss to my friends. I literally acted the same, just slimmer. And it's a bummer because she would seem uncomfortable around me and wouldn't even hold eye contact with me. All right, this is from Today I Learned, posted by Sappy Gilmore. Today I learned that Cheetos were designed to be addictive. A 2013 investigation found that Frito-Lay spent $30 million a year on 500 chemists and psychologists to attain the perfect mix of crunchiness, aroma, and mouthfeel. They melt in the mouth immediately, tricking the brain into thinking it hasn't eaten much. I gotta say I'm not surprised. I don't think I've ever gotten full eating Cheetos. Oh, and over in r slash science, Guilio Magnifico brings us Researchers are calling for exercise to be a mainstay approach for managing depression, as a new study shows that physical activity is one and a half times more effective than counseling or the leading medications. Obviously, your mileage is going to vary, but I think many people will find that just the act of going outside for a walk and getting some sunlight will improve their mood more than almost anything else they can do. This is the end of the video. If you liked it, please consider clicking like and subscribe. If you really liked it, please consider becoming a member. Members at the highest level get a short video every couple weeks about something that doesn't exactly fit into this video format, but is related. Special thanks go out to members Emmett McNally, Rig, Cupcaker Death, MMC, Megtran2000, Gato, That One Guy, Maria P, Average Loser, Wolf Child Rusk, Just a Girl, I Cuddle Cats, and Orle Christine. I wish all of you wonderful people a wonderful day.